The Juneau World Affairs Council and the University of Alaska Southeast, in collaboration with KTOO, present the 2023 World Affairs Forum, Immigration, Detention and Power, Addressing Bias and Prejudice. In this lecture, Establishing Compassionate Immigration Policy and Practices, Director General of the International Center for Compassionate Organizations, Ari Cohen, explores compassion's role in developing and executing practical, humane, and effective immigration policies and practices. Um, as I start, I want to uh, clarify th that what I'm going to be talking specifically about is compassion, and I realize there are all sorts of other concerns uh, involving life on Earth that need to be addressed environmentally and politically and so forth. But because I only have 45 minutes uh, uh, to speak, I will s and just cover all the uh, all the areas and everything and achieve total enlightenment takes an hour. So I only have about a 45 minutes, so this is what I will uh, do. And I will also mention, I may stumble a little bit, uh, uh, Dr. Johnson uh, famously said, nothing focuses a man's attention so much as the prospect of being hung in a fortnight. So I'm hoping I won't be hung after this. So um, the points we're going to cover uh, in the, this short period is what is compassion and what role does it play with respect to immigration? And does compassion provide a more effective framework or context for responding to human power dynamics and conflict? Uh, what, is it, what is its impact on the stakeholders' worldview? What elements support a compassionate approach? And how does this approach impact bias and prejudice? And lastly, how does it make the immigration process more manageable and effective? Well, I'm going to start with looking at the dynamics of human behavior, which we deal with a lot. Uh, I'll have quotes in here. I really like this one from a an article called To Tackle Extremism, We Need to Know the Enemy. So this speaks for itself. Um, what I find interesting is that we are witnessing the fascinating paradox of a nation of immigrants res wrestling with the dilemma of what to do about immigrants, you know, those foreigners that all our ancestors were, most of our ancestors, and understanding what it is to be human and applying demonstrated, disciplined, and authentic processes based on compassion can help reduce bias and prejudice. And I'll show you how as we get into that. Uh, I do a lot of work with Dr. Paul Gilbert at the University of Derby in the, Union, uh, in the uh, United Kingdom, uh, who got his OBE for the, from the Queen for his work in uh, compassion. And he's the head of the Compassionate Mind Foundation now that's in Greece and France and Australia and, and, and the United States. And um, Dr. Gilbert took a look at human beings uh, having uh, three general affects. The first one is a drive affect. That's the one that's going on now, is where we're trying to achieve something. Uh, it's resource focused and uh, we're, we're in action. The second one is soothing. And the soothing one is uh, when you are not wanting any, anything. It's very affiliate uh, related. And, and it's like when you're uh, hugging your kids or uh, you're just reading a book or kicking back. That soothing, which is uh, a process that's a very, part, very much part of a healthy uh, life. The easiest one to trigger in uh, most life forms is the threat. Um, affect and uh, with good reason and I'll talk a little bit about that and what we see in dealing with the issue of immigration is this retreat into the threat affect and I'll talk a little bit about how you maneuver your way out of that but they're, they're, um, they keep yelling fire uh, when there's no fire so um, cultural changes can be threatening and uh, I've always heard that for all of those of us who fear change, they don't, they don't, we don't need to worry because that's all there is. Endless, endless change. Um, the cultivation of fear increases threat, but to maintain threat, I will, I will say, you have to increase it. 
because people get acclimated to threat, it starts to lose its, its juice. So cultivation and drive and soothing, cultivation of drive and soothing can alleviate threat. And I'm gonna talk about five bodies where you move your consciousness into and you can get threat into uh, perspective. So this is uh, my idea of what a human being looks like. And uh, so we talk about uh, realities. And in my work, I talk about the universal field. The universal field is everything. All galaxies, all piece, pieces, all microorganisms, everything that is way beyond our comprehension. We do not have enough uh, synapses in our brain to gather the whole thing. So we do a thing where we pick information out of that field uh, through what we call the lens. We're applying our lens to pull this out uh, to uh, go through a pro process of selection, interpretation, and association, which is great. Uh, and we create our own construct. Frequently, we think that's reality. No, it's, it's a very, very, very small piece of reality. So we have the construct. Where we run into problems is when they collide. And you have these overlays to the construct in this model, such as religion, uh, economics, education, media consumed, family, and peers. So uh, like the uh, differences in Northern Ireland are driven in some, it's largely uh, economic, I think, but religion because of Protestants and the Catholics. And uh, as far as uh, education, have you learned to uh, work with critical thinking? And uh, different ethnic groups have different ways of being humorous. And if you're not in a certain ethnic, eth ethnic group, when they're laughing hysterically, you're wondering, what did I miss? And it's just, um, it just can be really uh, funny. But your family in influences uh, ho how you construct the world from, uh, from when you're a child. The, the, I had a doctor tell me that a, um, baby's child, uh, a baby's brain is not growing, it's exploding. They're, they're getting information so fast. Like the, the first question was, what the hell happened? I had a great ride and I was in all this warm liquid and then and somebody squeezed the bee jeepers out of me and what is this? Who authorized this? Yeah, I seem to remember something about that. Uh, so when you have these two universal fields, you get conflicting constructs. If you have people that are oriented to righteous law enforcement and so on and people who are trying to survive who have constructs that don't match then you are at risk for conflict. And I'll talk about how that's, uh, how we can resolve that. Um, we have, we're, we're considered modern, but we, we do have still ancient brains. And this is a quote I, I like uh, about the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from old ones. Because, because old ideas are comforting, they're familiar. So the evolutionary elements are first, all uh, living organisms, uh, their objective is survival. That's what they've got to do, and, and we're a living organism. Uh, relevant survival elements are high sensitivity to threat, and what's different about us is this incredibly high degree of socialization and cooperation that we have. I mean, I, I, we had a dog that was half wolf and half Malamute, and she could talk and bark. And those are the two things. She, she could go, oh, 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 got it, and bark. But the sounds that we make in all the different languages that we force air up through our larynx and shape the sounds. So, I mean, if I were to tell you, Guru Slananshkili, I don't know if you would agree with that. <laughs> it's, it's if you, you have a speaker, it means bring no harm to the speaker. <clears throat> so, uh, relevant evolutionary characteristics are Threat evaluation shorthand, we have a way of framing threat in a way that we recognize it immediately and uh, react to it, but we can also communicate it. And as, as an example, uh, when flying, if you have an engine failure, you could say, wow, that's not right. Uh, this is wrong, and you're on the intercom to the guy in the back seat. Hey, man, the engine just went down. And the guy in the back seat says, that's not good. 
What do you think? Well, I think I better call the ATC and tell them, yeah, I think you should, but we haven't got enough altitude. I think we're going to hit the trees. <laughs> or you could say, we've got a flame out. Harden up, prepare to eject, and then talk to the ATC, and then decide what you're going to do. And if you've ever heard a call like, like that, you should see what happens to your body, all the bumps you get, and you go, oh my, I'm in trouble. I just, you know, there, there are bears down there in those woods. <laughs> oh, wow, pilot. Oh, we haven't had pilot in weeks. So we have that shorthand. And, but among our species, we have these collaborative responses to the unfamiliar. And it's because we specialize. We are powerful in community, not as powerful as individuals. So we, we uh, work with those um, elements. And we have a, an incredibly sophisticated social uh, organization that we're so used to we don't get how fabulous it is. I don't know who made the lunch I had today. I don't know where they got the flour for the bread. I didn't have to go out and forage for it. Somebody made the box that it came in. Somebody built these chairs. It's this incredibly high degree of integration and socialization that is so well developed that you can take it for granted. So. Threat-based manipulation, when, when um, uh, the discussion this morning with, um, uh, about when you're talking about the, the stuff that came, I read in, on Thursday from the Washington Post about all the adjectives that use. This is from Harper's Weekly. I think it's June 1871. And wh what we have here is Lady uh, Justice uh, with her whip that on the whip it's, it's labeled the law. And here is an Irishman. It just so happens I happen to be Irish. And, and not only that, this is not a Catholic Irishman. It's, a, it's an orange Irishman. Happened to be an orange Irishman. And he's got his shillelagh, and he's dropped his shillelagh. And, and every Irish person knows, you should never drop your shillelagh. You should keep it with you at all times. And he, you look at his clothing, his ratty shoes, and his uh, patched pants, and his ragged clothes, and everything. And the caption, I forget what the caption says. Uh, Hooray, hooray, or something like that. This is 1871. This isn't new. And the whole thing is that the Irish were uh, subhuman, and they were going to take over thing, things. Well, we're not subhuman, and we did take over things. So <laughs> there you go. But what is striking about it is that threat-based manipulation sells because it activates the threat center. And so it sells Harper's Weekly, which increases circulation, which then draws in more advertising, just like NBC or Fox News or anything like that, and they lead. We had the Nisqually Quake in Seattle, and I saw all the new, and I, I was there because all the books fell on me. And they had a picture of a Nissan, and a brick wall had collapsed and crushed it. Seattle had been destroyed. Well, the power was out for about 15 seconds, and I had to go up to the, the Safeway and pick up some things. And I just hated that, that the earth shook. It shakes all the time in Seattle. And an old building that they were taking down collapsed because it didn't have the other support walls. There was a little um, kid, a first grader, that I talked to. I knew his mom, and I said, well, you, were there. you had an assembly. You guys were in an assembly, right? Um, when the earthquake quit, hit, what, what happened? What did you do? And he looked like me like I was the consummate idiot and didn't know. And he says, well, we stood up and cheered for Mother Nature. <laughs> I thought, you need to talk to CBS. <laughs> um, it's a distraction. It pulls us away from the real issues of what's going on. And, and if you get in the threat, you're not uh, talking about these terrible immigrants who are going to come across a border, who are going to contribute some of the genius that we don't have to, to fix things. And, and you know, it's, it's a distraction. It drives adverse social, political, and governmental objectives and actions. It's used to control. It also strengthens the illusion of the need for centralization and control. And it's a justification for restricting rights. Uh, the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. We have people that look like they're Japanese. Let's build a barracks in the desert and put them there. But the Germans, they look, uh, they kind of look, look like the rest of us, so we won't do any internment camps for the Germans. 
struck me as rather uh, out of balance. Uh, it can create long-term divisiveness because if you keep feeding that and playing people off against each other, uh, you get the divisiveness and you can maintain control. So we use a model uh, called the five bodies model, and they're not really bodies, but they are aspects of being, and they are the physical, which is this physical dense stuff that you occupy, the emotional, the feeling nature of a person, the situational, it's the milieu that you're in, like here we have these lights and we're, we're talking with each other and the air temperature's nice and so on. That's a situation. Uh, the mental issue is the executive function for human beings where we make decisions and decide things and so on. And then the transpersonal are the significant aspirations and beliefs of people that lead you on. So a pursuit of compassion is a transpersonal belief. A belief in human rights is a, goes in the transpersonal bo body. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the, the emotional is it's not logical and it is not linear. I did a, a program for uh, hospital executives at um, what's that? Snowmass Institute in Colorado, and they they seemed rather constipated to me, and so I said. I got up there and I said, I'm just honored to be in a room uh, full of mystics. And boy, the room temperature dropped out five degrees. I said, well, I may have had bad information. Let me, how many of you have ever kissed anybody? How many of you have kissed your wives? Well, there's a scientific way of kissing, which is you track the target, you approach it, you begin to decelerate, you have to cant your head 17, 18, uh, probably 22 degrees. You're gonna apply lip pressure so to be half a pound, two pounds, everything like that. You have to have enough oxygen to sustain yourself because you can't breathe when you're doing that. And you have to know the timing of kind of how to disengage because if you're a guy, you'll be a cretin if you don't do it right. <laughs> or you can just kiss the people you love. And it was Wittgenstein who said, the scientific view of the world is how the world is and the mystical is that the world is. And so I, I I'm a big advocate for mystical kissing. But the, <laughs> the emotional is so great because it's, it'll do a short circuit and get you out of trouble. So fear is a very useful uh, survival tool. So it's not linear or anything. It's very, uh, very impo important, and it should not be uh, oppressed. Uh, one of the problems is, for example, women fr frequently complain when they're in, in their emotional body, they're feeling bad, they will talk to a male who's in the mental body and says, well, why don't you do this? That's not the point. It should get into the emotional body also to match them and say, you sound like you're distressed. Yeah and like that and, and work like that. So that's where it jumps, jumps around. So um, in looking at the emotional body not being logical, it's not supposed to be. It's the one that saves your butt when things are threatening. The threats trigger the emotional body. And that's what this stuff that I read in the Washington Post, is. it's geared totally to that. These people are rapists and everything, all of them. Do they take medication to be able to sustain themselves or how does this work? It's ridiculous. And then the mental body is the locus for existential self-management. God, that's a great word. And threat decreases in the mental and transpersonal bodies when we reframe our identities from them to we. So if you're up there uh, from the transpersonal body and you're saying, why am I here? What is my contribution I'm going to make? What is it I value? You're probably operating in a pretty good uh, position. So when we take a look at what's going on in social groups or individuals, we use um, this model. So I'm going to talk about compassion, its role in response to threat. This is our mantra for the International Center from Schopenhauer, who, if you've ever seen a photograph of him, he's, he's really rather sour looking, but he's, he's quite bright. Compassion is the basis for all, all morality. And uh, so I'm going to show you a video and I guess it's just work, so, uh, and it'll explain compassion better than me talking to you, so I hope this works. It's, it's no sound at first. I hope this book is good. I, I'm not gonna wanna buy it if it's not.
There you go. So, compassion, the word compassion comes from the Latin com, uh, which is with, and passio, to suffer, and it's to be with one who suffers. Um, compassion, uh, uh, Strout Taylor and colleagues uh, searched the literature because there was a lot of variance in what people thought compassion was, and came up with five elements. The first of being is recognizing suffering. So instead of demonizing people at the border, why are they coming here? It's because they had it so good in their home country, they thought, well, maybe I'll try crossing the U.S. border just as a, uh, what, a hobby or something. It's not like that. You recognize the suffering, and the second is you understand the universality of uh, human suffering, and actually the suffering of all sentient beings, and uh, you uh, have consideration for the, the person or persons that are suffering, um, but not an identification with it. Uh, you can get seduced into uh, taking on the suffering yourself, which is a mistake, and uh, to, uh, tolerate uncomfortable feelings. This is a point where a lot of people have a lot of trouble with because it can be, my brother was a medic in Vietnam and um, he had the disposition where he could just handle it. He had one incident where a guy, he was loading a helicopter and a guy grabbed him by the trouser leg and said, doc, doc, am I gonna die? And my brother looked down and said, yeah, just, just relax. And he watched the guy, die. he died within three seconds with an abdominal wound. Um, and then be, uh, motivated to take action. So it is a motivation. It isn't the action itself. Compassionate action is the action. So we need to make that distinction. So it has to have these, generally speaking, these five characteristics. Uh, and sometimes compassion is confused with, um, uh, for example, what's uh, the first one would be empathy. Where empathy is great. It's intellectual identification. Uh, sympathy, sharing feelings, especially in others' troubles. Um, pity, sorrow for another's uh, suffering, and charity. All those are different than compassion. And uh, too often compassion gets lumped into uh, a variety of uh, different uh, ways of viewing. And uh, it has a lot of nuances. Compassion advocacy is just what it says. It's for advocating compassion. The International Center is a compassion advocacy organization. We promote compassion. There's compassionate action. Uh, we, I just spoke about compassion being a motivation. Compassionate action is the application of the principles of compassion into some sort of concrete form. Assimilative and non-assimilative compassion. This is a big, dangerous area. I got a call from um, the um, child burn unit at Harborview Medical Center in Seattle, and, and, and their nurses were burning out just couldn't deal anymore. And uh, because they're treating these kids, they, they really love these kids, had great compassion for them, but it got to them and pretty soon they couldn't function. So I said, you've got to rotate them out and rotate people in and learn at what level, how, how long they are working with these kids before they start assimilating and get them out there because the kids are suffering and you don't want your staff to also suffer. And so non-assimilative, uh, assimilative um, compassion, uh, please excuse me, English is a second language for me, or should be, uh, <laughs> stumbling. Uh, and, and having that logic of having the wisdom to pull yourself out of the situation when you know and get somebody else in there to work with it. I think if I were, working with immigrants, I'd have a hard time because when my ancestors who were Irish came into the United States, they took a lot of crap from that. And I mean, it's still passed down to us about what happened. And so I would have a hard time. So um, the idea is to stay non-assimilative as you can and then shift over because we're human beings. We identify, we're motivated to be with people who are hurting and feel it. Uh, compassion aversion, that's when you can't stand it. You don't want to see suffering. You don't want to know about it. When's the next dinner party? Uh, don't tell me about immigrants or poor people or that all that distasteful stuff. That's compassion aversion. And the one, one of my favorites is compassion bypass. 
Years ago, I saw a TV commercial of a tobacco company when they were still doing TV commercials, and it was during the Kosovo conflict, and they showed that they had flown in $10,000 worth of aid. Now, how much did they make a day? How much did the co commercial cost? The commercial cost probably at least $300,000. That's compassion bypass. They're not compassionate. They're trying to sell, sell cigarettes. There's this wonderful quote from uh, Melville's Bartleby the Scrivener, one of my favorite short stories, where the attorney seeing Bartleby, who prefers not, uh, and the, uh, the, the attorney says, here I can cheaply purchase a delicious self-approval. And so this is what these people do. And I'm a little bit militant about compassionate bypass. So acknowledging different people in different worlds, we differ in so many ways in terms of genetics. I'm six foot two. Uh, my oldest son is six foot four. And my youngest son is six foot eight. When we go to the bathroom in the mirror, we have to stoop because we can see from here down. And uh, it's genetics, it isn't because we have such rapier-like wits and dynamic personalities, it's just genetics. Family dynamics, uh, and a lot of this is, is uh, cultural, what, what comes down. Um, my father had a lot of sayings that are violent sayings, but they apply to compassion. One is he said, it was advice, never go into a fight alone. And so we tell people, if you're going to take up compassion or you're going to re help work on immigration stuff, don't go in there alone. Get as many people as you can. And the other one that everybody likes is that um, he said, you should always be courteous. And when you come upon the fight, you say, excuse me, is this a private fight or can anyone get in on it? And we tell them that anybody can get in on compassion or any of the things we're talking here. So that comes out of... Uh, Family dynamics. One other thing is that uh, my one of the things we do in our family is that we congratulate people by uh, insulting them. Uh, so my brother, my grandson Sean Joseph was there, and my brother came in. And he said, "I understand you got yourself a national award." And I said, "I did indeed." And he said, "Oh, they're letting." people have awards don't you just love this country and I said well that's not the happen when they found out that my brother that your poor self had been dropped so severely on his head after birth that that's that accounts for the, the terrible de deforming of his features and Sean said what's this and I said this is he's playing like he's being envious and he's congratulating me and Sean, Sean says well, why doesn't he just tell you nice job and my brother looked at him with con uh, conspicuous uh, disgust and said what's wrong with you what'd be the fun in that so that's family <laughs> dynamics culture social settings um, they took us on a visit all over uh, here and they provided a sunny day. It's people of power, the people here. Uh, and we went all, all around here through Juno and talk about changing attitude and relaxing yourself and everything. So it's a really lovely setting. Uh, education and knowledge, uh, and especially factors like learning critical thinking, questioning. So, what is going on here? What's happening? And so, the higher level of education, the, the greater. Uh, chance you are being able to uh, understand how things happen by studying philosophy or studying history or uh, psychology or whatever. Um, and your affiliations, who you affiliate with. And I have to be careful not to just affiliate with the likes of you and to get out there and get my hands dirty with people who are, um, who are not like you. They're very different. And I, that's not as much fun as being with you. Um, and then the values and beliefs that they, uh, that they have. And uh, it, that varies among people and so on. And this, uh, my mother's English, and she's landed. In, in England, they have royalty and stuff. But if you're landed, you're not a royal. But you're referred to as my lord. And I, my lady, and I was visiting my mother in and her housekeeper said, oh, is this, my lord, is this your first visit to England? And I said, no, uh, it's my second. I'm not, I, the only lords we have in America are motorcycle gangs in Oakland. And she goes, oh, very good, my lord. <laughs> <She's> like, <laughs> yeah, so I thought that. Uh, I brought that out because I'm expecting a higher level of regard for me when this presentation's over. <laughs> 
If you want to call me my Lord, it's perfectly all right. Probably won't happen. And then your life experiences. Uh, when you have the setbacks, when you see things that cause sorrow, when you see things that motivate you and these directions that you take through your life. I was, I was going to become a... Uh, I was going to go to the Air Force Academy. I was nominated by Senator Warren Magnuson. I was going to fly... Um, uh, ground attack missions because, you know, Top Gun, which is called air superiority, superiority, I have a difficulty understanding all that distance from the ground. Uh, but I was good on the, uh, over the treetops and so on. Until I had an epiphany, my father was a tank commander in World War II, was terribly wounded uh, at the liberation of Luxembourg City and had nightmares about that. Well, ground attack is communications interdiction, transportation interdiction, close air support, and armored interdiction. I was a tank killer, so I quit because I saw what happened. Uh, so applying compassion, uh, it'll bridge cultures because what happens is the defenses drop when people cease to be threatened and when they begin to be heard and people are thinking in terms of what they have to go through. It lowers threat. Uh, if people are threatened, uh, the first obligation is survival. And so they're going to go into that context of uh, self-preservation. So it lowers threat. It builds trust. It establishes a common ground. If you're willing to listen, my colleague, uh, Tony Bilak, um, at the center, he, he, does anybody remember going postal? Uh, he's the one who stopped it. He is the U.S. attorney who had them implement, um, oh, he's one of the ones that stopped it, implement uh, active listening, mediation, and all this stuff with the U.S. Postal Service. And he's, he's the most compassionate person. I mean, compared to me, me he's like light years uh, ahead. I, all I have is my rapier-like Irish wit, and that's about it. And he is just remarkable in how he how you hear the parties and how you position things to uh, establish common ground and, and get uh, uh, suitable resolution. It fosters collaboration and it puts a focus on solutions, the mental body, rather than the emotional body. The emotional body is important because very often it's a driver. You get passionate about something. You get, you get passionate about the environment or you get passionate about, I'm trying to learn French, and it's not going very well. Bonjour. Um, but I'll get there because I have a colleague in, in Lille and her son, eight years old, got on, the, on uh, Zoom and said, Bonjour, Ari. Do you like the English? Your English is perfect. <laughs> Will you parler uh, français? Yeah, I'm going to learn uh, to speak French. So I'm trying. Okay, so application in immigration environments. This wonderful quote by Mandela of our human compassion binds us to one to the other, not in pity or patronizingly, but as human beings who have learned how to turn our common suffering into hope for the future. And that is a brilliant encapsulation. So uh, reducing bias and prejudice, we need to understand and respond to one, the nature and source of real and imagined threats arising from immigration. You know, we, I've heard how terrible the immigrants are. Where are the results? Where, where, where are our cities that have been destroyed and our freeways collapsed and berry, berry breakout? Or where, where is it? The second one is the opportunities to reduce the experience of threat for all stakeholders. How do you lower all of it? And the third is, Who's profiting from cultivating fear? A big profits to be had in it, especially politically, because there are people who do not have the critical thinking skills or who have experienced threat in their lives and have a low tolerance for threat in the lives as they have now. They're fearful. And the, excuse me, opportunities to develop strategies and methods for reducing fear and manipulation. So when people, uh, for example, on the left, poo-poo all those Southerners and and right-wing and Trump supporters, they're just feeding the problem. Because the people say, now I've got to put my defenses up more. So when I live in Louisville, there are a few people who support Trump in Louisville, Kentucky. I drove out from Seattle and somebody said, aren't you going the wrong way? 
Um, and uh, when somebody says, oh, I just love Trump, and I say, well, what do you love about him? And they'll tell me, so, so you're really concerned about that stuff. Uh, now, I don't agree with you politically. That's cool that you can, so I'm concerned about that too. And slowly, it's like pouring water on something that's calcified, it begins to dissolve and they get more supple. So uh, recognizing differences in objectives in immigration, if the global objectives for uh, immigrants are betterment and opportunity, well, in the immigration authorities, it's border integrity, that's their job. As far as uh, primary objectives, um, uh, they want to flee adverse conditions. It wasn't that the things were so good they had to get out of there. Uh, and then for the immigration authority, compliance with the law. Uh, secondary objectives would be they're seeking sanctuary, freedom, opportunity, prosperity, um, positive future and so forth. Uh, the second objective uh, for the immigration authorities are they need to stop illegal immigration and they may need to result to expulsion, detention, or prosecution of offenders. And the methods are legal and illegal processes for immigrants and uh, the immigration authorities' is enforcement and expulsion are uh, options. And the challenges are, the legal challenges are limited opportunities uh, extensive vetting, long waits to, you know, get in. Illegal is you have to hide within society or you get detention without rights. For the immigration authority, it's illegal immigrants are equated with criminals, uh, denied rights that citizens enjoy at ra risk of maltreatment. And so there's this disconnect that, <clears throat> excuse me, that operates. So cultural competence is a key to this. This is from Dr. Uh, Aaron Rollins at the University of Louisville Department of Urban and Public Affairs, and he, he says that uh, we need to provide systems, agencies, and practitioners with the ability to respond to the unique needs of populations whose cultures are different than one finds in one's home country. And compassion fosters cultural competence. Um, and then building that competency, fall, the elements fall into three areas. Attitudes, we need to change to become more world-centric. Am I an American? Yeah, but, I, but, but that's after I'm a world citizen. Uh, the policies, we need to change those to become more flexible and culturally imp impartial. It still gets me that we're a nation of in immigrants having problem with immigrants. Uh, and then practices, we need to become more aligned with cultures outside our own home nation. And um, that isn't work. That's really delightful to, f to find out uh, what, uh, what other uh, people do. I was <clears throat> Irish people tell stories. I, when I was 19, I had to support my mother and my brother, and there's no work in Seattle. And so my aunt lived in LA, so I moved down there and got a job at Transamerica Life Insurance in a building that they were getting ready to close down, moving file folders across to the new building. And the guy who worked there was a Latino. And I'd never seen a Latino, you know. We didn't have those in Seattle that time. And he and I just hit it off. And he, he showed up and uh, one day at work and he said, my mama wants you to come for an authentic Mexican dinner on Saturday. What am I going to say? <laughs> no, I don't like Mexicans. No, I said, oh, sure. That'll be fine. And then I had to think about it that night about they, they eat it. I can, it's not going to kill me. Uh, they, I can survive. Yeah. So I went through that and I went there. And they were lovely people. And she said, uh, his mother asked me if I had Mexican food. And I said, no, and we don't have that where I come from. And she said, well, I'll fix you three tacos. Oh, that's fine. We'll put a little, this is called salsa on it, a little salt and pepper. That'll be fine, ma'am. And they all hovered over me to watch me take a bite. <laughs> I thought, oh, jeez. And I took a bite, and my head was down, and I chewed it for a second. And I looked up with hooded eyes, and I said, where do you get more of these? And she just screamed. And she's laughing so hard, she says, your soul is Irish, but I think your stomach is Mexican. <laughs> and it's right. I can't stand Irish food. It's horrible. So that, that was a good lesson. 
So uh, looking at compassion from a public health standpoint, there are five steps. And the public health movement was started, started by Dr. John Snow in London when they had a cholera epidemic. And everybody was trying to figure out, do they need to have the priests come or do they need to shake salt on top of people's head? And so what Dr. Snow said, is we got to look at what's going on, do an assessment. What is the one thing they have in common? And they reported back, nothing. The only thing is they are all drinking out of the Broad Street pump. So he petitioned the London Council to have the handle to the Broad Street pump removed, and public health was born. The cholera epidemic stopped. Now, what he wasn't applying, he's a doctor, was not applying any splints or medication. So he, that's collaborative program design, and then educating the constituents and applying it, review, modification, reapplication. And, and uh, that's when we're talking about applying compassion. How do you do it? What's the mechanism you do it with? What language do you use? And so on. And you're in this constant process of continuing evaluation. So the elements of the immigration process that I see is you have what I call the three I's, the immigrants themselves, legal and illegal. You have the immigration policy and practice. But I think there needs to be an addition called immigration continuing support, whether they're admitted or not. If they're sent back, they need to have the support. So the objectives are certainly legal compliance, we're a nation of laws, compassionate support, and continuing uh, co compassionate continuity. That means once somebody's in, you don't stop there. You begin helping them integrate. And we have a lot of uh, private uh, nonprofits that do that. In Louisville, they've got a uh, Latino place where people get English skills and learn jobs and stuff. We need to have more of that. Uh, and it needs to be uh, expanded as a uh, cultural norm. So if you look at uh, this continuing compassionate support, obviously you're going to want to do that when people are being integrated after immigrating into the United States. How do you support them in doing that? But I also think if people have to be turned away, there should be repatriation path to work with other countries and say, well, they couldn't get in the United States. Where can we get them? Or can we get them in a place in their country of origin where they're going to be safe and stuff and devote the resources to doing that? So the benefits of a, uh, applied compassion are uh, improvers, improved stakeholder relationships, reduce stress and conflict, and none of this batting heads, um, increased efficiency, lowered operational costs, and improved stakeholder satisfaction. Now, I've applied these principles at a level five maximum security prison, and they work. I mean, that's the toughest test that you can have at uh, the Clown Bay Correction Center in Washington State. So that's it. I think I just put you through drinking from the fire hose. So I will, any questions or discussions? Step one is applause. Oh, definitely. Thank you. So any questions about this or comments or? Questions? Advice. <laughs> Ari, first of all, magnificent presentation. It's a pleasure being with you. Uh, there's, there's two slides that I just wanted to uh, just confirm where you were going with them. So one was the different goals of immigrants and yeah. authority. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that when you were talking about the goals of immigration authority, you're already contextualizing mm -hmm. those goals in a specific place and time, correct? Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, and it, it represents the goals that are, appear to be established now. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Because obviously this is very fungible, right? Meaning uh, Im Im immigration authorities, depending on whom they process, for what they process. Right. Because immigration means they're gonna stay. They're gonna come in and they're gonna stay. Yeah. Right, they're not migrants, they're immigrants. Mm -hmm. So I just wa wanted to clarify that because it could be the other way around. Yeah. Meaning you could have immigration authorities, and if you recall, the for example, in, in the case of the United the, the United States, uh, what they called the um, the uh, uses, right? Mm. Uh, they they changed, for example, the mission from talking about a nation of immigrants and how uses was to facilitate immigration to now talking about national security and how to establish the rule of law. So it, it's 
clearly telling, I mean, we, we, have, we really have to contextualize that yeah. authority. And then there was a slide when you talked about, um, you said immigrant or, Im or immigration, I wasn't sure, but you said immigrant and then you put legal and illegal. Yeah. Did you mean legal and legal immigration? Because uh, I don't see how an immigrant can be illegal. judged by the authorities of being legal immigrants and other ones that are Ill illegal. Thank you. So, yes. so that's a judgment of the authorities. You're yeah, yeah, yeah. A different discourse. Uh, and I have a hard time saying so. Yes. It, how do you do about the people that even you conceptually or see is halfway? Are those semi illegal immigrants? And do you have quasi semi illegal? Well, the, you just the, have people. The, well, yeah. Well, it's the actions that, that are yeah. going to be quote unquote legal illegal, not the people, right? So mm -hmm. yeah. I, just, I just wanted to clarify because when I saw it, it, it's kind of struck me like that will not fit with compassionate migration. No, it, it's I put it up there as the classification that I see most common because that's okay. what when, when I'm working with the compassion thing, I start where they are and then try to subtly or not subtly begin looking uh, looking at object labeling that, that doesn't work. I, I personally think people wanting to come to the United States are not a threat. I think the greatest threat to the United States is the United States by far. I mean, uh, we, we're just, I mean, there's some just crazy stuff going on within this country that we need to get our act cleaned up, you know, still. I mean, there's still, uh, I was at a talk and uh, after the shooting at Columbine, and s some guy stood up and said, we need to own who it is that's causing this trouble. And I was the only white guy on the board. And the guy said, it's, it's the Irish. It's the Pope's trying to take over America. And I went, whoa, wow, they haven't seen this for 100 years. And uh, when he found out I was Irish, he said, what did he say? I didn't mean you. And I said, well, Let's do this. Now, I could really lay into you with righteousness and so forth, but you learned this somewhere. So this is a real opportunity to go back and think about it. And if you need any help, call me, because uh, I think you'll find out we're, we're all right. In, in the United States, you mean a specific uh, group? Right now, um, the, a lot of the institutions, the government certainly, uh, the, the people under the previous administration are a terrific threat, but also a lot of the institutions. I mean, even in policing, uh, you see this discrepancy between um, uh, groups that are fairly well-adjusted to law enforcement in a good way and other ones that are border, oh, not borderline. They are criminal organizations. When I worked at Clallam Bay, the maximum security prison uh, 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 up in uh, Washington State, the staff was just shocked me how with it they were and how sharp they were and how they got on with the uh, people that were incarcerated there. I was expecting a bunch of big house muscle and it was really, uh, really amazing. So I think we're right now in our culture, we're our own worst enemy and that we've, we need to clean up here a lot. And we need, we need to make sure that cartels aren't coming in and all that stuff, sure. But the stuff that was discussed earlier here, you know, it's that's just uh, utterly heartbreaking. And what are we being cheated out of? Thank you for your clarification. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I was going to say uh, real quick, if, if Ari would come down, can I get um, relationship advice and counseling from you um, in the future? <laughs> but uh, my real question is, you're, I was really fascinated when you were talking about the shift, the perspective of them versus we. Um, and I hear about those stories, you know, especially people in the South, Americans who say, oh, got to keep Mexicans out. And then their friend who also like illegal immigrants and Mexicans out. Um, but then they don't realize their best friend or close friend is also illegal. And then they get deported and say, I didn't mean that person, though. Right. So how do we how do we address that? Or how does that get into how is that? Can, how can we put that into play as well in the broader discussion and picture? That is a brilliant way the human mind can can uh work. I saw it just as a digression, but I think it applies. Wonderful Tonka Toy commercial, three uh, 10 second vignettes. The last one was a, a, a little, little girl. girl. And the idea is to show that Tonka Toys could really take it. And this little girl had her doll and the head was off and the arms and everything. And the mother had it and she, you couldn't see the mother's face. But she's shaking this in front of the girl and the little girl and she says, Teresa, what happened to this doll? And the girl looked at the doll, looked at the mother, looked at the doll and looked up and said, nothing. <laughs> and I think we do a lot of that. Uh, we, because we, it's so critical that we have relationships to survive. 
that, that we will create a type of hypocrisy that on the, uh, when you look at it from the outside, it looks ridiculous, but in the moment works. And so uh, you, you'll see those kinds of things because people get in that emotional body and it's an irrational body. And, and uh, uh, when, when they kick into fear, it's just interesting to see. So when you have those dynamics where people can't see the paradox of what they're in or the hypocrisy of what they're in, um, in some respects, it's almost a survival uh, technique. And so when you're pointing that out, it has to be very gentle, very collaborative. Otherwise, the fear they had that they're about to get squashed for it, it happens. You're doing it. So, yeah, so that's it, I think, for time, right? Yes, thank you very much. Oh, yes, thank you. That was Ari Cohen discussing Establishing Compassionate Immigration Policy and Practices. It was recorded October 14th, 2023, at UAS on the unceded territories of the Akhwan on Trinke Ani, as part of the 2023 Juno World Affairs Forum, Immigration, Detention, and Power, Addressing Bias and Prejudice. Produced by KTOO and the Juno World Affairs Council, in partnership with the University of Alaska Southeast. With support from Poor Alaska Kensington Mine and Ramada by Wyndham. <laughs>